Uh, Matthew chapter 8. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centuron, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them, and followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the, unto the centurum, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid, and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits which his, with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities, and bare our sickness. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came, and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee what's whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fe fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds of the and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gargisnes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by their way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and her and a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled, and went their ways into the city, and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts.
Amen. <clears throat> the title of this message, which more or less is going to be just an outpouring, I guess, of some things I've been thinking about, feeling, experiencing lately. <clears throat> Verse 22, it says, Let the dead bury their dead. Obviously, you follow Christ is, is the charge he gave. Follow me, he said, and let the dead bury their dead. Now, um, last year, of course, and, and over the last year, um, I spent a lot of time visiting with, traveling about, you know, upon encouragement from from uh, Brother Shane as he was here, visiting with the new IFB churches and new IFB people, right? Fellowshipping with them, developing friendships with them. Um, but that time seems to be over. <laughs> it seems that we've, we've made a transition. And I, I think there's definitely a, a new chapter as far as this church goes. And this is kind of what I want to talk about. I want to set a few things straight, and I don't know where this message is eventually going to get out, but I really want to talk to our people here and I want to talk to the people that are in Toronto at large as well, if they would ever get the opportunity to hear something like this. <clears throat> Whenever there's a new chapter, there's an old one that goes, right? You turn a page, you leave it behind. Let the dead bury their dead, as it were. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to what is known as the new IFB, and it's, it's, it's debatable what it even is. I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been something to be compared to the old IFB, and then the next moment it, it doesn't exist and you, you're confused about what what it is it's an anomaly but looking from the outside in and I've, I've heard it referred to in both cases the new IFB is either a, a philosophical idea or it's a denomination we really can't get away from that it's either a philosophical a knowledge-based movement as it were or it's a denomination and it's found its way into becoming that now as independent Baptists we pride ourselves in being independent Baptists, every church autonomous. There's a reason for that, and that's so that the devil can infect the head and thereby destroy the whole body. Okay? If the head is sick, the whole body is sick is the principle. So we are independent for that reason. Nobody lords over us, and therefore we, don't, we aren't influenced by or affected by what goes on by these churches that oversee the churches that oversee the churches as all these things tend to get denominations always end up corrupt because the head is easily destroyed what comes out of these baptist um, bible college and others always ends up being destroyed because it's being led by a central hub so again it's either a denomination or if it's a philosophical idea a movement <clears throat> and either way i don't want to be a part of them i never set out to be a part of them and certainly this last year or so I've strayed from my conviction on that, certainly. And I ask God forgiveness for that. Certainly it's good to have friends. Certainly it's good to have fellowship with other churches. But it's gotten a little close. And I believe part of what's happening here with the divisions going on is as a result of God actually trying to break these things asunder and have people go back, have churches go back to being properly independent. We ought to anchor to Christ. And when I started coming out to Toronto, that second sermon that I ever preached, in the dying moments of that sermon, and it was used against me at that time, <clears throat> certainly it, it, I, I put a flag down, and it, I don't think it was forgotten. I said, if the whole movement should turn against us, I said, and we're following Christ, let it be. So be it. Okay? We need to be focused on Christ. We need to be anchored to Christ. If the movement is of men, where men move is where the, everyone follows. Does that make sense? If the movement is of men, if that's what this is, as men move, men move with them. Go to Deuteron Exodus 23. Okay, turn there for a minute. Exodus 23. <clears throat> so... While movements of men move this way or that way, the Bible records that we ought to be steadfast, unmovable, okay? Always abounding in the work of the Lord as a result. So, in looking back, and I'm, I'm going to try to just basically get some things off my chest here. For me, for us as a church, this needs to be a moment where we decide on a direction going forward, okay? Because there are certainly sins 
in the new IFB as a whole, okay? There are also weights, and the Bible records that we're to lay aside both. Let us lay aside the sins and weights which so easily beset off. And I want to get some of this weight off of my chest. This is for me, if anything. <clears throat> now, the former reason for getting involved with this group was primarily soul winning. When I first started to know of this group of people and these churches at large, it was a group that was like-minded doctrinally. It had a heart towards soul winning, winning souls, preaching to the lost. Our hearts were knit by that. And there was a great group here in Toronto that had that same mentality and that same desire. <clears throat> it was independent churches that were all laboring in the same direction. And this was exciting. The early years we can think of, three, four, five years ago, what it was like to be around in these groups, in this, in this internet movement, as it were. <clears throat> but now we've strayed from, and I've seen a, 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 a turning from being like-minded doctrinally to it being expected that you be lock-minded doctrinally. In other words, no difference whatsoever. Everybody's got to think the same as whoever is leading the charge and whoever is the one mind we're to follow. We've started majoring in minor doctrines. It used to be that to determine whether a church was good, it was three things. Do they have the right gospel? Do they, do they preach the Bible? Or do they have the right gospel? Do they have the King James? And are they, are they preaching the right gospel? Those were the three, three things. <clears throat> do they soul win? Was the third one, sorry. <clears throat> and that one was one that you could even bend on because you could start a soul winning thing. But now, to be a church that is approved, there, it, the list goes on and on and on of things that are expected. And we can tell that because of all of the different reasons that have come up why churches have been expelled from the group, the movement. <clears throat> now, where before the hearts were knit by winning souls, now their hearts seem to be knit by the souls themselves. Unfortunately, it's become a cult of personality. Okay? Everybody is all about the personality of the pastor, the, the man that he is, what his character... We, we, we look to these men instead of looking to win men. The only, the only cult of personality I want to be involved is Christ. Him being the focus, right? Now we've gone from having a whole bunch of independent laborers that that meet together for the purpose of those labors, now it's become a, a movement of shaming and memeing and railing and just, just swarming all and all those people that don't agree, that don't follow the personalities to a T. I had to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Verse 1 says, Thou shalt not raise a false report, put not thine hand with the wicked, to be an unrighteous witness. I'll get into some specifics here. <clears throat> it says don't raise a false report. It says don't put your hand there with an unrighteous witness. And in recent days, and I'm now going to deal with specifics about how our church has been affected directly about this, <clears throat> Pastor Jonathan Shelley did both, raised a false report and an unrighteous witness against myself and against this church. Okay? Now, weeks before the Red Hot Preaching Sermon came out, there was another little tidbit added into a sermon which dealt with me. There was, there was a rebuke. It was a posted sermon. It was later clipped up by someone local. <clears throat> And Pastor Shelley was called out for it, for the lies that he said. He was rebuked for it by a pastor friend of ours, and, and it was later removed. And then two weeks later, he goes to the Red Hot Sermon and preaches the exact same thing now with embellishment about our church, this false and slanderous report of our church. He said essentially that Sound Words Baptist Church started... When I just simply decided to move away from Lighthouse Baptist Church, get up, I'm moving, Pastor, and I told him that, and my pastor said to me, well, God bless you, I hope the move goes very well, 
And then he prayed for me, and then I said to myself, Yay, I've been sent out, ordained now. Okay, that was the charge. You can go check it out now. It's still up online. <clears throat> What's the truth? Well, Sound Words Baptist Church started in Tim Zing's basement August 26, 2018. It was our first service. August 26, 2018. I moved at that time because we were in London, and then we moved to Stratford for about a year we were there. And then February 2019 came along, and some of you remember, because it was almost like this ceremonial move where my pastor met me on the coldest day of the year in Stratford, packed up my trucks with me, and I drove off to Kitchener, and then men of Sound Words Baptist Church received me there and helped me unpack. So it was almost this ceremonial move, but we remember it because it was that coldest day of the winter, right around February 2019. The last Sunday that I was ever at Lighthouse Baptist Church was July 28, 2019. Six months had passed. And so if this whole crazy lie and slander that Jonathan Shelley's come up with is true, then there was a whole bunch of nothing happening between the sending out and like five, six months of it, okay? He's got to deal with that. He was already rebuked for it and refuses to address it. Okay, <clears throat> I preached a sermon about a month before that last Sunday called His Own Received Him Not. And in that sermon, I dealt with an evangelist named Calvin Allen. Calvin Allen is one of these traveling about singer and preacher guys that goes about these revivals, stirs people up, gets them excited about the Lord. And he said on a Facebook post of my now good friend, Pastor Travis Bradley, um, he said that what, referring to Grace and Fritz and his whole scenario with... Um, with the police coming down on him and him having protesters for his sermon on Leviticus. <clears throat> what this Baptist evangelist said of Pastor Fritz was the things that he said were worse than a radical imam. He, he, charged, that, he charged that Fritz was, was non-biblical, he, he was wrong in every manner, and he even seemed to mock what the Bible teaches. I dealt with that because it was something burdening my heart at the time. I wanted to stand up for our preacher friend, Pastor Fritz. And as a result, finding out a couple weeks later, my pastor decided to have him visit, have a Calvin Allen visit. Okay, now as a result of everything that had gone on there that Sunday, before my last Sunday, I went forward during the invitation at the preaching service that my pastor preached, and I told him that I feel that my time here is has reached its end. I feel led of God to go and pursue sound words 100% of the time, because there's enough people there. They're, they're dedicated, they're motivated, they require more, they expect more of me at this time. And it had come to a head because we knew that this was the direction that things were going in. We'd been praying about it, because when I told my pastor that I felt the Lord is calling me to go do that today, he said, I've been praying and I agree with you. So at that time, we decided the next week we would, we would do things right. And that recording, as I often and always did, record our sermons there at Lighthouse Baptist Church, is available. It was online. It was there specifically for people here that are, are close to set them at ease. Someone that joined up with our church, well, it found its way into some other hands, and they've used that to lie about me again and further say that I'm secretly recording my pastor. No, that was a special moment that we shared where my pastor prayed for us, acknowledged that we were going off to fulfill the pastorate here in Toronto, and we were sent, yes, without the laying on of hands, but everything else. The work was confirmed by his presence here. The work was confirmed by his prayers for us. The work is confirmed by if you call him today, he will have good things to say about myself, my wife, and the work that's going on here. The only thing that he did not want, and the reason why there was no proper ordination, was because he did not want to be associated with Pastor Stephen Anderson in any way, and he knew we were. And also he did not like the way that we, in our ministry, name names. I reasoned that, hey, naming names is completely scriptural, and also there's, there's no reason why our association would venture in, in that direction, in Arizona's way. But he was firm and decided that that was the direction he wanted to go. Fair enough. So respectfully, we left it at that and came down here. And all of us are pretty familiar with what's gone on ever since. We're praying about, we're looking to um, the time when another child is born. That's my conviction, that, that two children ought to be had. 
And when that happens, an ordination will happen. We've had three offers from pastors that would ordain me, even today, okay? But we're waiting for God's timing on these things. <clears throat> Nevertheless, though Jonathan Shelley lied about us, slandered us, and, and I still wonder to this day what his motivation was because he's off in Texas. I've met him but one time shaking his hand at his conference, thanking him for it. Thanks for putting on this conference. It was wonderful. Great meeting you. That was about it. <clears throat> what the motivation is aside, you know, his lies aside, it's enough to, to, to rally the railer, certainly, isn't it? <laughs> People don't stop to check facts. And the problem is, too, is that people that are here, we're here in these very seats, who know us, who know the church, who know the story, believe the lies of this guy who knows nothing about us. Okay? And that's unfortunate. But that's how things work. Okay? The problem is, and it's, it's become apparent, okay, as everyone remember Dale Shedrock Vieira, you know, famous, famous, uh, you know, fan of the new IFB, posted and shared everything, okay. In the earlier days, he, he became someone that was ostracized and, and, and looked at as, that was a strange thing. Like, it's, it's weird to be such a, a fan, like, a, like just excited and just, just obsessed with this movement, making it into that weird sort of denominational culture. That used to be strange, right? And that was put away from and shunned from. But now, that's almost the majority. It's majorly full of those chat rooms, that group, the, the people that associate with the new IFB are predominantly carrying that, that sycophant, psycho fan, obsessive attitude to where anything that is negative said about them, they react with such rage and vehement desire and try to draw, destroy and tear down anybody. Somebody lies about somebody and they'll just get on top of it. And that's exactly what happened with us. Again, I'm just trying to vent some of my opinions. Please be gracious. <clears throat> so it didn't matter that what was said was a lie because the damage is done. People just buy it and believe it. And we have people that were in our church that the next week they're not because of the lies that were told. Okay, And that's a shame. Never mind the attacks that are coming in from the other side of the world. I really don't care. But why, if, the, if it's not a denomination, why did what happened in Texas and California affect the congregation here in Toronto so much? And it's a, it's a, it's a brutal thing because it's not even like the, the suggestion was made, oh, Soundwords is a bad, ch bad, bad church. Go to the church across the road. No, 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 no. None of those people are in church. And if I'm wrong, they can call me up and correct me on it. But I don't have a feeling, and I know of the churches that they would go to. I don't think they're in them, okay, the people that used to be here, because of what happened down there, okay? And that's, that's a problem. Again, we're getting to a directional thing. So if that wasn't enough to ruin us, okay, then go with me to verse 2 there in Exodus 23. It says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after me to rest judgment. And this is exactly what happens with this mob herd mentality, right? They follow a multitude to do evil, and the Bible forbids that, okay? And then there's also a decline. Notice there's, there's no climbing. And as Christians, we want to press on the upward way, new heights gaining every day. But here they're declining after that multitude, declining after that many to what? Rest judgment. We've been going through Deuteronomy and just finding time and time and time again, God wants justice and judgment and right just judgment. He wants when something is seen to be diligently inquired before any justice is made. He wants two or three witnesses to everything that goes on. And yet what happened to us was one phone call from, from one guy who for some reason hates me to my pastor that was just broadcasted as lies, and now we have this issue where for some reason what's going on out there is impacting our church people here. They've declined after many to arrest judgment, and now we stand here marked and avoided, but it's not enough. We're getting railed on, we're getting attacked, we're getting slandered. My name is still in the mouths of these people all the time. It's crazy. And, and you know what? I got out of the Facebook realm before this sermon even happened. 
but I'm still hearing from friends that it's going on. And it's not just me, it's all of these other preachers. They've accused us of being, uh, what's the word? Um, just, just basically trying to leech off the popularity. We're trying to get famous here. We're freeloaders, okay? Look at all of our stuff, okay? And if you look around the churches in, in the new IFB at large that have also been thrown out as being freeloaders and bad people and all this kind of stuff, they're in the same case. I mean, we had more to lose than gain. Now, granted, okay, I wouldn't know any of you were it not for the new IFB. Okay, we, we came together because of soul winning. Okay, this church wouldn't have been founded were it not for the people that followed in that soul winning movement, agreeing on doctrine, following after Christ. I think it was that at the time. We wouldn't have known each other were it not for that. But after that, I mean, I, I don't know. If someone must be hoarding the checks or, or all the goodies that are coming because I'm just not getting it. <clears throat> and, we, and we've had more to, to lose. You know, I, do you realize this is this is the second pastor in my life that I've I've tried to defend and knew I have B to, and now I got egg on my face because they proved to be exactly what they told me they would be. These people are fleshly, carnal. They're they're not right with God, and I'm like, no, they're good. They're right people. They're 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 just zealous. They want to do right, and and I defended them, and now two pastors deep, I I have to I have egg on my face because of the characteristic that I've come to know and find in the new IFB. Freeloaders, I don't think so. We've lost friends. We, we lost the opportunity for, for an ordination that probably would have happened through my church in London, were it not for my association. More to lose, right? We know churches in the South and in the States that, that had to lose a ton of members before they gained a little bit back, and then what happens again? They lose them all again because those people weren't part of those churches. Those people were just there filling seats. Their heart was in... Arizona. Their heart was in Sacramento. Their heart was in Texas. They were never actually plugged in members of the church. And we've experienced that too, haven't we? <clears throat> People that left because they were never here to begin with. It, you know, they went out from you because they were not of you. I know that that's talking about like reprobate bad people. The principle is the same. Their heart was never here. That's why they're gone. So we want to change the direction. Now, of course, that's one cause for attacks, okay? The next was that sermon that I preached a few weeks back that was up, posted online. We took it off because of the flack that we were getting, just trying to give my wife a break from all the stress that was going on. <clears throat> it's back up now, and it's all available. But they used this sermon to say that Josh blasphemed Jesus <laughs> and, and all of these, these extreme examples. Again, if somebody's wicked, you don't have to exaggerate what they're saying. Just put it out there. But they've snipped and clipped and trimmed that sermon this way and that. Brother Tristan the other day was listening to a hater video, and he's like, this is good preaching. And then he reads the title, and it's like, Josh Gander attacks the word of God. And he's like, I didn't hear that. <laughs> right? You, you shouldn't have to lie about people if their character is wrong. Now, that sermon's up there, and, and though it may not be, it wasn't perfectly explained, and though it could have been misunderstood what I was trying to say, the ultimate thrust of, of that message on laying on of hands, I stand by. And that message was this. Without a call and without the proper understanding that there's a need for grace and mercy, without those two items in a pastor's life, you're not qualified. <clears throat> there's... There needs to be an appointment from God. The man needs to be appointed to that work. And the man needs to understand that he's in need of grace. What am I trying to say? These guys can't be 100% relying on their own will, their own desire, they call it, for the office to keep them in the office or they'll fade. And I've heard it said from some preachers, I could be just as happy doing any job. How can that be so? Unless you're missing something called the call of God in your life. Certainly I could be happy doing many other things, right? But God has me here and I believe that. And if it's not here, then it's going to be in some other aspect. But, it's, but, but the, the what of God's will is important to me more so than the where. 
And I also understand in my life that I need grace and mercy because I'm not a perfect person. And the problem is, is that men end up like those 99 just people in the Bible which need not repentance. Right? God looks to the one contrite heart, wants to save him, that one, right? But then there's 99 which need not repentance, but everybody needs repentance. The problem is they don't recognize it in themselves. So they don't recognize that they need God's grace. They need God's mercy. They need to repent day by day, moment by moment. And that was the ultimate bottom line thrust of that message. <clears throat> was that God calls preachers. God calls pastors. And they need to be pastors that are humble enough to admit that they're not all they're cracked up, they think they're cracked up to be. And I personally would rather than stand with some of the new IFB pastors, I would rather stand with Paul and John and Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, and their reaction to the call of God in their lives. I'm not calling myself a major prophet or anything, but I, I connect with them because all of those men said, I'm undone. All of those men said, I'm not qualified to do this work. All of those men said, you know what, Lord? Send somebody else. That was Moses. I, I can't lead these people, was, was what they always said, okay? And yet we have modern-day preachers saying, God didn't call me. I appointed myself because of my desire, and I meet every qualification that God would expect. You see the difference in attitude there? It's not biblical what they're saying. Okay, so that's the thrust of my message. It's still up there. And yet they've taken that message and condemned and marked and reprobated me because of it and said that I said that Jesus is not qualified to be a bishop. If you look at my words, if you mark my mouth, if you listen to what I said, I said the IFB would disqualify Jesus. Why? Because the qualifications that they say is the utmost impairment to being a bishop is the husband of one wife and having children in subjection. Jesus Christ does not meet that, and therefore the IFB would disqualify him. I qualify him. I say, absolutely, if Jesus Christ was here, he could be my pastor, he could be my leader, he is fully qualified, he is, he is the only one who is qualified, he's the man for the job. The Lord Jesus Christ is the bishop of my soul. Bottom line, I never took that away from him. I gave that to him and took it away from myself. And unfortunately, I also took that away from many pastors in the meantime. But I know pastors that have the spirit that says, man, I can't do this apart from Jesus. And that's what the thrust of that message is. I can't do it without Jesus. I'm only doing it because Jesus told me to. The call of God and his grace and mercy is what spearheads me into this ministry. If it was based on my own desire... I could find something a lot less stressful to do. Okay, I could find something a lot easier, a lot more enjoyable. This is enjoyable. Don't get me wrong. This is a blessing. Most of the time, I just love what goes on here in this church. But it's also str a struggle at times. But I'm trying to get some of what's a struggle out and move forward in a new vein. Okay? So, <clears throat> finally, and... Depending on how you look at it, firstly, I would say, the first and bottom line problem, when Jonathan Shelley stood up and put water bottles all over the place dealing with the different preachers that he had fault with, I'll tell you this, I know of half of the stories there, firsthand, lies were said, okay? So if I was lied about, certainly they were lied about. Wonder about the man who will stand behind God's sacred desk and knowingly lie, because he was rebuked about, personally, what I dealt with. Wonder about the man that will lie on purpose behind the pulpit. Okay? Take heed. Mark that. Okay? <clears throat> so finally, or firstly, <laughs> the lockdown was a, was a major problem, and why we've been attacked. Okay? And how we dealt with the lockdown. Now, <clears throat> we set out specifically, I think, three messages that dealt with the lockdown. The first was like a call to get excited about serving God. The second was dealing with what the congregation is to the Lord. And the third was actually dealing with my heart in regards to the churches that did close and trying not to be 
too critical of them, right? Trying to have the spirit of the father and not the spirit of the son in the story of the prodigal son. Those were the three that, that really dealt with it. And of course, throughout time, as you often do, you bring in illustrations to other preaching, but I didn't focus specifically on the shutdown after those three primarily messages. And yet, this was looked at as, as such a, a great offense, I believe, and often the primary one, because while I continue to make posts and, 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 and plead my cause or whatever on social media, which I was wise to and eventually got out of, <clears throat> that was what ultimately, firstly, kind of turned the tides. So I had preachers come to me and say I was being loudmouthed, and I went to each one of these in particular until I started to realize it was, it was fruitless, and I was actually advised that you don't want to pursue that pastor because he's not looking for peace. But, but, but two in particular I went to, saw it out, and said, hey, look, I'm not attacking you personally. <clears throat> it was said and it was dealt with in the pulpit that, that um, you know, I had personally attacked Pastor Jimenez in his positions. But truth be told is another pastor friend of mine was the first that I got those ideas from. I didn't realize that Pastor Jimenez had the same position until afterwards. After then, the sermon's already preached. And it is what it is. Again, I don't often go specifically at people's positions or thoughts or anything or personalities. <clears throat> I try to deal with what the Bible says and what God's laying on my heart in that moment. But regardless, I apologize for the hurt that I had done, but it fell on deaf ears and it was just like a snowballing effect. Lockdown, attacking the, the ordination and the legitimacy of the church, and then finally this sermon, and they're just like, look, they're reprobate, the church is no good, and, and that, that's what was broadcast. And it, it affected people in a real way. It hurt me. I don't, I don't stand up here excited about this. I made friends. I thought I was developing friendships. I, I, I've, I've lost a lot of what I thought I had as far as real meaningful friendships goes, and I learned a lot of lessons as a result as to what real meaningful friendships are. I've met a lot of great people, a lot of great pastors, and, and I'll continue to fellowship with them. But any pastor that I now stand with is, is like, you know, what's that, twice, once bitten, twice shy? They're, 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 they're almost, almost shunning association at this point because they don't want to fall into that same denominational trap that they got into in the first place. It's, it's dangerous. It, it is super dangerous. Again, why is Toronto being affected? by something going on the other side of the country. It doesn't make sense, okay? So, <clears throat> back in Matthew chapter 8, the phrase is, and you can go to Luke 9. In Matthew chapter 8, I'll just read it quickly. because we're going to get the same story from a different angle. It says, Now when Jesus saw the great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart to the other side. In verse 21 it says, And another of his disciples said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. So my observation, and again, I don't rejoice in this, and I'm not happy about this, but from the context of, of, of hear and sound words and and what we're seeing out there in the group we all came to know each other because of is let the dead bury their dead. What do I mean by that? This is a dead movement, okay? As all movements end up. Because, because if man is the motivation, if man is the focus, if man is what keeps it turning, it's dead. And certainly there's still activity. But the Bible says in James, it says faith without works is dead, correct? So if faith and works aren't together, it's dead, that dead faith. I would also say that works without faith, if they're not together, it's a similar state of being dead. Their works are dead without faith. Their faith is dead without works. Those two need to be together in order for there to be life. And what you see coming out of there is nothing but, and we've talked about this last few weeks, is carnal works of the flesh. People mustering up enough of their flesh to do spiritual activities. And we see this all the time. This is why Christians quit. This is why Christians get excited about serving God and then they flounder and fall away is because they were doing it in the power of their flesh. I believe the NIFB to be spiritually dead by and large. 
The other thing that we notice is that the NIFB thrives on adversarial conflict. They love it. If there isn't conflict, they muster it up. We recognized this when we were, when we were first in the basement, okay? Things were heavy and hot and exciting because Bill was attacking us, right? We were seeing all of the, that going on for the first few weeks. It was exciting. There was a new spirit of change. We got out of the new and we're into the old, and it was exciting. And then it kind of stopped because Bill just went his own way. He had made his, his few videos, and, a, and there was a week or so that there was no more drama to talk about. And so what happened? We made drama, didn't we? Now we're not looking at Bill. Now we're like, hey, Josh never goes soul winning with us. And we stir up a whole thing. We don't like how Josh is, is working with his pastor. Let's get another pastor. And they start all this inner conflict. They thrive on adversarial conflict. They love drama. They love fighting with one another. And if there's nobody to fight, they'll make somebody to fight. But look what's going to happen. <laughs> Eventually, it'll be let the dead bury their dead. A dead movement going to bury their dead. Do you know what they're going to do? They're going to destroy one another. So it says in Galatians chapter 5, it says, if they, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not destroyed one of another. And when there's nobody else to reprobate, there's nobody else to fight with, there's nobody else to create drama with, they got their own meme channels where all they're doing is they're just, they're just making up memes about Pastor Johnson. They're making up memes about Pastor Major. They're making up memes. I find a few in there. And it's just memeing and memeing and memeing and joking and laughing and tearing down good churches. What would be good churches in these areas? The best church in these areas that people should be in <clears throat> when they run out of memes, when they run out of drama, when they run out of people to fight, the dead are going to bury their dead. That dead movement and the dead Christians that are in there are going to destroy one another. This is what Christ is encouraging us to do is to not get distracted. Let the dead bury their dead. Look forward. Press on. What's next? He says, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. He says in another place, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The first action of getting with God and getting after God and being a Christian is following Christ. When you follow Christ, He makes you the fisher of men. You don't become a fisher of men and expect God to be on board with you, which is what I've heard these guys say. And that's why I say these movements are carnal because they say we went soul winning. We got people saved. We did this. Yeah, and God was there too. That is saying, I'm a fisher of men. Come on, God, follow me. No, it's wrong. Follow Christ and he will make you fishers of men. That's the right order. That's the, that's the right spirit. In Luke chapter 9, in verse 56, the Bible says, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And how often do these, do these preachers destroy men's lives? Look, my life isn't hindered, okay? My life generally is not harmed. But it certainly hurts to find people that would be your friends attacking you. It certainly hurts to find people that used to sit in your pews leave you because of what someone else says. Christ's ministry was opposite, not destroying men's lives, not destroying men's ministries, which they're fighting to do, and they have done to some people. To save them is why Christ came, and they went to another village. Verse 57, it says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow, follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Okay, so they went to another village. Matthew tells us they went to the other side of the lake, actually. And this comes up to him, this certain man, this disciple. He says, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. I love that zeal. He's excited about following Christ. But look what Jesus responds to him. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He's saying, there's certainty with the animals. There's certainty with others of my creation. They have a place to lay their head. They have an abode. But Jesus says, I don't have that. In other words, there is faith involved in following me because you don't even know where you're going to lay your head at night. And I'm experiencing that more and more and more in my Christian life, that some things are just not so certain, but what is most certain is Christ. 
and His desire to lead us. That's why He says all the time, follow me, follow me, follow me. He wants us to get after Him and follow after Him by faith. Verse 59, And He said unto another, Follow me. But He said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So what's our focus got to be? I got to look forward, okay? Everything that happened, that was just me kind of therapeutically getting things off my chest. I hope you all enjoyed me sitting on the couch and allowing, allowing me, you know, you guys were like my, my therapist for today, okay? Some things I just got to get off my chest. I've done no defense of myself in this whole thing, okay? I haven't felt it needful. I have no desire to, to speak and to reconcile with, with, with uh, Jonathan Shelley. I look at him sideways. Something off in there, that situation, okay? Like I said, when you can lie comfortably, knowing you're lying, that's, that's scary. Okay, I, I have a fear that's of what's going on because, not because I've been shamed or attacked or anything like that, but because of the way that these men, these Christian men, are treating one another. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Abraham's promise is still true. I will bless those that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. The promised seed was promised a blessing and safety in the Lord. Okay? How much worse do you think it is? We know that that seed is Christ. So we know that those that bless Christians will be blessed. And those that curse Christians will be cursed. How much worse do you think it is when it's Christians that are cursing Christians. Stripes. It's what's going to be visiting those that do such things. And I don't want to be involved in those things either, okay? And this is the problem, is that kind of mentality is contagious. Like we talked about, following a multitude to do evil, declining in that same way to rest judgment. Certainly I've been guilty of the same, declining in that same direction. I've been affected by my involvement with the new IFB, but i got to get over it i got to get past it. On to bigger and better things. And here Christ says, let the dead bury their dead. And at this point, that's what I believe is going on. A dead movement is going to bury one another. And you know what? If we're not there and we're not involved to attack, you know what? They'll just devour themselves. Ignore it. It worked with Bill. Ignore it. It's working with Zing. Ignore the attacks. Ignore these people. And you know what? They'll, it bothers them worse than anything. They're not all this. But some of these are some of these people, w with that attitude of you know I'm I'm self-appointed and I'm qualified, pride the amount of pride that's involved there. Some of these people are just love themselves more than anything, and as a result, they love when people attack them because it allows them to fulfill their desire for attention. So ignore them, follow Christ. Let the dead bury their dead, but what do we do? Go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Go thou and set forth the good news. Go thou and get to work in the ministry, building the kingdom that is not of this world, but the kingdom of God. And that's the difference. Let the dead bury their dead, build the kingdom of God, something that is lasting. This denomination, this, uh, this movement of men, this, this idea that is connecting these people is not the kingdom of God. It's a contrast. Okay? Let the dead bury their dead, I say. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God, Christ says. And another also said, verse 61, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What do we see here? That our focus needs to be kingdom-mindedness. We need to be focused on bringing people to the kingdom, on growing things of the kingdom, setting our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That way we're laying up treasure which moth and rust doth not corrupt. I've been too, too focused on what's going on here on the earth. I've been too focused on, on growing and learning and, and, and meeting friends, on, on gaining um, attention from people. I've, I've been too focused on a movement of men and not focused on what God is doing moving in this world. Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou, preach the kingdom of God. And it says this, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We need to be looking forward. We need to be pressing forward and not looking back. Look, 
We couldn't repair those things if we tried. I've got a few more people that I'd like to talk to personally, not to settle some scores, but to get, again, some things off my chest so that I'm clear. And the Bible says, if, if, uh, if you go to lay your gift before the altar and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go, first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. And that's what my desire is in a few situations. I tried to yesterday. I laid a gift. I was going to come here today and lay a gift at the altar. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try to be reconciled because I've, I've, I've heard someone again bringing up my name and lying about me and lying about my wife. So I know that he has ought against me. Maybe he's misinformed. Maybe he misunderstood. Maybe he's just lying on purpose. But I'm going to go to that brother and try to set it. But my focus needs to be on the kingdom. And my focus, now that I've put my hand to the plow, I can't look back. Okay, and I'm, I'm encouraging all of us to do the same. Like I said, I'm hoping with, with a, a message like this, aside from my therapy session, that hopefully this will be something that I can reach out to the wayfaring brothers and sisters that were here, okay, and say, hey, here's a little bit of an explanation as to, to what happened in my point of view. Accept it or don't, but we're drawing lines here. The line is behind me and I can't look back over it. If you want to stay back there, that's your choice to make. We're going to draw lines and we're going to divide over these lines, okay? So that's kind of my desire here. And I just hope that, uh, that the spirit of the message is, is found there, just in that last verse. Putting his hand to the plow and looking back. No man is fit for the kingdom of God that does this. Let the dead bury their dead. Let's go and preach the kingdom. Let's go and teach all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's our charge. Giving ourselves to the Word of God instead of giving our efforts and our time and our energy toward a movement that is showing itself to be self-destructive. No kingdom divided against itself shall stand. And what do you see over there, aside from a kingdom divided against itself? That's not the kingdom of God. Okay? Okay? I thank you, Lord, for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have here as a small group, Lord, to just meet and, and assemble and gather. Lord, I've, I've often put this ministry before you with hands open and uh, said it's yours to do so as you will. Close the door, open the door, take my voice, give me a voice. Remove my messages from my heart or give me more each day. And Lord, I believe you're continually asking us to press on. Okay, Father, I, I believe that the, the what of your will is more important than the where. And, and I, I say here before witnesses, Lord, if you want us to move from this area, if you want us to serve you in a different capacity, if you want me to step down, step aside, if you want change, you're free to enact it. Okay, God, I don't want to be a part of, of something that is displeasing to you. God, I feel like that, that, um, that last year when I went around and kind of jokingly said that, you know, I'm, I'm shaking hands and kissing babies. It was vanity, trying to get the approval of men. Lord, I want your approval. And I want you to smile down upon this church, this congregation, as we try to seek you and work for you and, and please you by faith. It's yours, Lord. Like I said, you're the bishop. You're the chief shepherd. I'm just trying to and off filling miserably to be an under shepherd, Lord, to try to be a representative here. Of course, never stacking up. I repent where I've fallen. Help me, Lord. Fix my unbelief, Lord. Be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. Help us as we step forward into this next chapter. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.